Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our uh, webcast. My name is Vlad Jerinovsky. I'm a president and CEO of Craner, um, a private wealth management company. And today's topic is uh, global perspectives. Uh, with us is, um, is a good friend and a great speaker. He's a 23-year investment services uh, uh, veteran, and uh, his name is Tom Chimiri. And Tom is a vice president uh, and senior client portfolio specialist for Voy Investment Management. So Tom happens to work with a very good friend of mine, Doc Cote, that I've known for many, many years, who's a senior portfolio specialist at Voy as well. And um, Tom is a new addition to our team. He's been with us relatively recently. Uh, however, over the short period of time, we've learned um, a great deal about each other and uh, value his, uh, his opinion, his point of view, and the fact that Doc Cote vetted him. Uh, definitely believe me, you're in for a good, good, good um, experience for our call today. How about that? Absolutely. So, I think everyone can appreciate, and with the fact that the market has a 6% pullback today, um, again, on the fear of the um, second wave hitting, and um, we, um, we thought it would be an appropriate time to discuss several things, and this is why we have time with us. You know, we, uh, one of the things we want to discuss is the fiscal policy and U.S. economic outlook, the pandemic and the 2020 election, what could potentially be happening in the political sphere. You know, the, the Fed policy has uh, drastically um, sub changed over the course of the past several months and uh, the amount of money that became available to support local businesses and families has been absolutely tremendous. And, um, and overall, we wanted to seek uh, guidance and opinion from um, a senior portfolio specialist on how and what should you be doing with your portfolios to protect yourself and at the same time, capitalize on the fact that, you know, in three years, none of this will matter. So I'd like to turn this over to Tom. And Tom, welcome and enjoy, enjoy this webinar. I definitely will, Vlad. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me on the call today. Pleasure to be here. Um, as Vlad was saying, I've been in the industry now for over 23 years. But over the last nine of those before joining Voya, um, I was a wholesaler. I was a fancy title being a regional vice president where I would meet directly with financial advisors like Vlad and really educate them about the markets, especially during these times when, you know, it can be very emotional. There's a lot of fear out there and really helping financial advisors educate them about the markets, what's going on, what our thought process is, um, and really relaying that information to them so they can in turn navigate you people directly through this market as well. So over the last nine years, as I mentioned before joining Voya on March 16th, I was a wholesaler, worked with many different financial advisors out there. Um, I'm very happy to be here. It's a crazy time to start a new job. My first day was March 16th, which will always live in infamy for me because I go into the home office in Windsor, Connecticut, and I was there for no more than two hours until I got my laptop. I was told to go home, potential national quarantine that day, president speaking at 3 p.m., go home and get to work. And for the last three months, that's exactly what I've been doing. So hectic time, crazy time to start a new job, an amazing time though to be here on Voya Global Perspectives. Um, with that being said, what I wanted to do today is kind of talk to you a, a little bit about what's going on, not only today, but what we saw starting back in November of 2019, summarize the first quarter for you and talk to you a little bit about our thoughts going forward into not only the middle of the second quarter, going into the third quarter, and a little about and excuse me, a little bit about what we do at Global Perspectives. So, with that being said, I think the first quarter, and I've already used this word already, is going to live in infamy for everybody. Because if I had to sum it up today, I would say that the first quarter is going to be all about factoring in loss of life, loss of jobs, and loss of wealth. You know, the global economy didn't come to a screeching halt; it basically crashed into a brick wall. And we're slowly starting to get ourselves up from that. Here's the ugly side of what happened in the first quarter. We all know that the coronavirus started in China and it was officially declared a pandemic by WHO in February. Businesses and states across the country implemented draconian social distancing, which had dramatic impacts, not only here on our lives in America, uh, but also throughout the globe. What you saw was something you never saw even during the financial crisis 12 years ago, that this global economy came to a complete standstill shutdown. About a month and a half ago, 
the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis projected that there would be roughly about 47 million to 50 million people filing for unemployment, and that the unemployment rate would rise to potentially 32%. Now, they haven't seen that yet, but that was data as of about a month to a month and a half ago. You saw the Dow Jones Industrial Average plummet to a low of about 18,000 from its all-time high of 29,568, roughly. We saw crude oil in the first quarter drop from $61 to $20, and most notably, we saw it going negative as well, not too long ago. And never in my lifetime would I ever would have imagined we would have saw a negative commodity. During this pandemic, currently right now, we've seen over 40 million Americans file for unemployment. The current rate is actually 13.3%. It's actually much lower than we thought it would be at this time, and I'll go into that a little bit later. Again, we saw oil take a huge drop as well, turning negative. Gross domestic product, GDP, fell by about 5% in the first quarter. It's expected to fall potentially by 25% in the second quarter before things we feel start to get better in the third and fourth quarter of this year. Now, that's the ugly of what happened within the first quarter, but here's some of the glory side of this. Here's some of the good. We saw the Federal Reserve and the central banks, including Washington, come together. And they really came together to starve off something that could have been much, much worse, something that we haven't seen since the Great Depression. You have the Federal Reserve come in along with the central banks and implement quantitative easing unlimited. What that just means is that they were pumping the system full of money to keep the markets as liquid as possible. That was very important because there was eventually going to be a backstop in these markets, meaning that these markets could have froze, come to a screeching halt, and liquidity would have been a big issue. So the Federal Reserve stepped in with a massive amount of stimulus in the range of about six to seven trillion dollars, right? They were basically coming in acting like Godzilla to fight this thing off. Then you have Washington that came in acting like King Kong with their $2.3 trillion CARES Act, the largest single injection of capital in the U.S. economy to date. And versus these two titans that normally sometimes fight each other, they stared this thing down and prevented something much, much worse. Now, does that mean that we're out of the woods? Absolutely not. Now, there is a lot of optimism, as you see with these small business bailouts, uh, these bailouts going to individuals with the checks of $1,200 for certain families. You're seeing more of an organized committee to open up the economy overall. Um, what we feel going forward is what you're seeing in the stock market potentially that started as a V-shaped recovery may turn into a W-shaped recovery, meaning that we went down very fast, we went up, and we may test new lows again. Um, with the economy, we feel we're in a U-shaped recovery, and we're at the bottom of that U as we speak. So we're going to plateau for a little bit before we start to go back up. We're far from back to normal here. But with the help of the government, the help of fiscal policy and monetary policy by the Federal Reserve System, they really helped prevent something that could have been much, much worse. You know, there's a lot of miserable economic stats out there. And if you look at April, April may have been the worst month that we saw from an economic standpoint, considering that sales plummeted about 16.4%. That was worse than the expected 12.3%. Travel, leisure, and restaurants that sector just got crushed. The worst hit area was clothing sales down 78.8%. And look, there's a big worry out there of unintended consequences of social distancing, shutting down this economy. In fact, Jerome Powell basically mentioned that the recovery may come more slowly than, we, than what we would like. You know, April is going to be defined as a deflationary period. And deflation means prices were going down. Deflation really means depression, people, and that's something we definitely do not want. What you saw in April, you had the consumer price index drop by 0.8% in April. That's a new record that dates back to 1947. And another index that measures price is the producer price index that was negative with a decline of 1.3% in April. That was also a new record out there, all right? Now, here's the thing. We saw these miserable stats in April, but the stock market continued to go up. Well, why was that? Well, for a few different reasons. Is that for one, 78% of the job losses out there were furloughed, meaning that the unemployment could be temporary and the recovery could be much faster. We had a slowing rate of infections at that time. And when you look at the job data overall, it's really, it's really backward looking. And what I mean by that is the April jobs report 
was really at the height of this crisis. So the market was really discounting what is gonna happen in the next six months. So there's a lot of optimism going forward. And finally, I would say stimulus, right? What I mentioned about a minute ago about the Fed and Washington coming together and implementing monetary policy, fiscal policy to starve off something much worse. Now, when you look at the month of May, there was a huge bounce back in jobs in May. You know, last week we had a great jobs report that talked about, or the, excuse me, that basically said we created 2.5 million jobs versus the expected 7.5 million jobs that were expected to be lost. That's a 10 million point swing right there. That was fantastic. Now, also, too, when you look at small business optimism, that particular index was actually up for the month of May at 94.4 from April at 90.9. So there's a lot of optimism out there that things are starting to return back to normal. What you're seeing today is what Vlad mentioned at the very beginning of this call. There's a big concern about a second wave of the coronavirus. This is why the market is down about 14 to 1500 points currently today. As the United States pushes deeper into reopening, um, there are states out there, like Texas, for one example, they have reported three consecutive days of record-breaking COVID-19 hospitalizations. So their cases are actually starting to go up. There's certain counties in California that are starting to go up as well. Um, another reason what you're seeing today, too, that there is a potential for weak earnings growth. That has basically increased over the last week or so because of these new cases that have been rising as America begins to reopen and also due to the protests that you're witnessing and you're seeing on the news each and every day, that that may also cause the coronavirus cases to spike as well. The Federal Reserve mentioned yesterday as well that the economy could contract, meaning pull back as much as 6.5% in 2020 before it starts to expand again by about 5% in 2021. So this year is going to be a very tough year, but there's a lot of optimism going forward. Um, the last point that I'll make here is that the central banks and the Fed will do whatever they have to to keep these markets from selling off as much as they are. Now look, that doesn't mean they are the solution. In fact, they're really not the solution. What the market really needs, what the economies really need, not only here in our country, but across the globe is a medical solution to this. And hopefully that comes sooner rather than later. Now, there's a lot of news out there. It changes by the day. It's 24 seven. And the point that I'm trying to make is, you know, there's a lot of um, fear out there. There's a lot of anxiety out there. And what we could do at Global Perspectives to help advisors like Vlad out there is really utilize our strategies. And what I wanted to go into maybe in the next five to 10 minutes is talk to you guys a little bit about who we are, what we do, and why we do it, and why it's important. Global Perspectives has been around since about 2012, and Doug Cote, who's the Portfolio Manager and Chief Marketing Officer of Global Perspectives, has been in the industry now for over 30 years. He has 30 years of investment experience, but he has a ton of experience in managing through bear markets. He created Global Perspectives with you, the client in mind, not the advisor in mind, because he always felt that the money management world, the asset management world, where I work, failed to protect clients during times such as these, during crises, bear markets, volatile times. And it brings me back to when I was at Lake Mason, another asset manager, and I was there for over five years from 2007 to 2012. So during the financial crisis, there were a lot of asset managers out there that were creating very exotic products out there to be, as I would call a silver bullet, to protect clients against the next crisis, against the next bear market, which we know there's no such thing. Now, the names of these products, you may or may not know, and that's okay, but these are 13030 funds, long, short mutual funds, global macro funds, market neutral, right down the line. They sound very confusing, and most of them actually are confusing, more importantly, they never lived up to their hype. And if you look at those products in the first quarter of this year, they failed to protect clients miserably. You know who didn't? Doug Cote at Global Perspectives. And the reason being, his philosophy and his methodology is based on fundamentals. Years ago in 2009, 2010, um, you heard the argument, you may have heard the argument that fundamentals no longer matter given what the Fed did during their periods of implementing quantitative easing. I will always beg to differ that because fundamentals will always matter. 
I was also being told that asset allocation doesn't work, and I will beg to differ that one as well, um, because during the financial crisis, unless you were in gold or U.S. treasuries, there was really nowhere to hide from that carnage. So what we do at Global Perspectives is basically is we base it off of fundamentals. And in fact, I'm going to jump ahead very quickly because what I'm going to show all of you today is really the secret sauce of Global Perspectives. Doug's number one factor that he looks at is corporate earnings growth. Now, Global Perspectives has been around for almost nine years. Doug Cote is a top decile manager. His mutual fund is in the top 1% in the country. His portfolio is in the top 2% in the country. His market models that he manages as well. Now, there's really not a ranking, but behind the scenes, they are top 1% as well. And Doug bases everything on corporate earnings growth. And that's important because with his back testing that he did before he created Global Perspectives, there was not a direct correlation, but a high probability that when corporate earnings growth turns negative, there's a bear market on the horizon. Now, if everybody could see my screen as I circle over Q3 2019, this is when corporate earnings growth turned negative at negative point. 3%, 0.3. That's his signal to say it's time to get defensive because a bear market is on the horizon. Now, he looks at other factors as well, such as manufacturing data, inflation data, but basically leading economic indicators at the end of the, at the, end of the third quarter of 2019 were going down. Something was on the horizon. His models definitively picked it up. Now, did he see the coronavirus coming? Absolutely not. If he had that power, well, I'll tell you, he wouldn't be managing money right now. He would be on the beach living the good life for, for the rest of his life. But point being, we saw that turn negative, and on January 1st, or excuse me, January 6th of this year, we got very defensive in our mutual funds and our models, and what we do is we sell out of half of our equity positions and go into fixed income. By doing so, Doug saved his clients from the worst bear market since the Great Depression. You know what happened on April 1st? Fourth quarter earnings, as you see here, if you look at that gray bar, right where that arrow is, they turned positive. They were positive at 3.1%, which means that's our indicator to get back into equities. And we did so on April 1st. April 1st, Doug will tell you, is the capitulation day in the market. Now, what that means is it's part of a psychology of an overall market cycle, which means everybody's selling for the sake of selling on no new news. They're just basically putting their hands up in the air, waving the white flag. And as an investor, they're saying, I'm just going to sell. I can't take it anymore. We were able to get back into the market at ultra low levels. And in January, we were able to sell at the very top. That's beautiful. That's perfect. Knock on wood but that's the way it should be done. Point being, I wanna take a step back in time to 2015, which is this bar right here, and even show you 2012. Now, the reason why I'm gonna point those out very quickly because corporate earnings growth turned negative during those periods as well. And what happened there was that Doug got defensive. But the Federal Reserve, the central banks, the Bank of Japan stepped in during that time and really starved off a of bear market. And Point being, Doug would always joke around and say that the Fed has his models. Because every time a bear market was on the horizon, um, that's when the Fed would intervene, whether it be with quantitative easing or the central banks or the Bank of Japan lowering rates out there in order to starve off a bear market. Now, with that being said as well, we offer and we talk about, and I'm sorry, my slide is actually freezing up on me here, to the next slide. So I'm, while you're doing this, I'd like to jump in very quickly and um, absolutely. I wanted to share something with the rest uh, with our audience. Um, you know, you and Doug are trusted partners. You know, I've known Doug for a long time, and um, but in all fairness, he's one of many partners that we work with. Mm -hmm. And when the consensus among the top portfolio managers, top PMs in the industry that something is about to happen, something is about to break, it's not normal, we're hitting new highs, evaluations are too much. Towards the fourth, in fourth quarter of 2019, this is precisely why we raised 20% in cash acro across the board in our clients' accounts. And many of you who are listening to this, you remember the conversations, you knew we talked about it, 
I also remember many said, what are you, out of your mind? The market's going up. And they said, listen, you want to be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. And this okay. is a perfect example for us to put some money on the sideline. Let's, gain, let's book some gains. If you recall last year, the market finished about 30% up for the year. I'm like, it's okay if we take some profit, right? So oh, yeah. in January, in all fairness, again, this was um, in my conversation with Doug, we rebalanced the portfolios because, you know, sometimes you just need to do that. It's part of your homework to make sure you, you stay in the course and the plan is working. And we actually deployed... So we rebalanced the accounts in January and then went towards the end of February or early March when the market really started to nosedive. We actually came in with half of our cash positions and invested on March 17th and 18th. And the, re the reason I remember that is because, well, I was spending a decent amount of time rebalancing and looking at these accounts and buying. And uh, Eric, who is the investment services specialist at Craner, you know, he was the one who's phys physically pulling the trigger based on our conversations. And then I, I touched base with Doug and Doug said, I, um, we, we're almost, we are almost there. To me at that particular point, being down 30% from record high was already a pretty nice discount. Right. And you're right, Doug deployed uh, his capital in the portfolios that he manages on April 1st. So within a few weeks of each other, um, as you can see the philosophy, um, of active asset management has produced stellar results for all of us. Go ahead, Tom, back to you. That's right, that's absolutely correct, Vlad. Great points and, you know, we did feel that was the bottom at that time. And again, you know, our thoughts going forward on that is that we may be entering a W-shaped recovery as of today uh, with the second wave of coronavirus uh, cases happening, happening much sooner than we thought because you were hearing that potentially the second wave could have came in early to late fall, it may be happening now, There may, which means if it is, it could be a third wave coming. Um, but just a couple more slides I just wanted to show you on, you know, some of the other factors that we look at. You know, when you look at our GDP within America, 70% of it is based off consumer spending. So the consumer is a game changer. You know, retail sales account for roughly about 500 billion per month of GDP growth. And U.S. wealth, before all this, was at an all-time record, which basically means that when we implemented social distancing, nobody's spending money out there. And that's not good for the U.S. economy, which is why we always spoke about that the, U, that the opening of America needs to happen sooner rather than later, and it has to happen much quicker as well. And then there's just one more slide that I want to highlight. As you can see, there's 32 slides. I would never do that to anybody out there. Uh, this is not the one I want. Should be this next one right here. My apologies, Vlad. This is the one that I wanted to show everybody. No worries. One respect is, as I mentioned, was in mind to manage clients' expectations and more importantly, manage emotions as well. Doug Cote would tell you that another tenant in building global perspectives is based off of behavioral finance, loss aversion. And what that means is that clients feel the pain of loss twice as much as feeling the pain of gain. You know, when you win, you feel good, you pat yourself on the back and you move on, right? But when you lose, you, you're sulking, you could end up crying, and you don't want to talk to anybody, and you just want to be left alone. That's, where, that's what loss aversion really is. But at the end of the day, you need to be invested in the market, but staying the course may not be the most prudent path out there. And you need to stay invested in order for you to achieve your financial goals and in order for you to achieve those retirement goals. And what this is showing you is, is what happens when – if you miss the best 30 days in the market over the last 50 years, that could drastically affect your portfolio. The value that we bring to the table with global perspectives is that we help take the emotion out of investing. We don't stay the course because we strictly follow our rules-based methodology for when corporate earnings growth turn negative, we will get defensive. And when they turn positive, we're going to go back to equities. Doug Cote gets paid a lot of money for saying corporate earnings growth is up. That's good. Corporate earnings growth, uh, growth is down. That's bad. That's as simple as simple gets out there. And I want to really pause here and now open it up for any questions that, any, that anybody may have.
Um, one of the things that I'd like to add to this is um, it's it truly is pretty remarkable to see and 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 realize that yes, most of us are very well educated. We watch the markets. Been working in this for many years. Doc for thirty, you for twenty three. I've been at this for twenty years. And yes, having an economic degrees um, uh, and and navigate through all of this is important, right? But fundamentally, you want to buy low and sell high and time and time and time again an average investor get gets in with um what we call a fomo fear of missing out and that is usually when most the professionals are booking their gains and selling to people who are coming into the market and then the markets go down and and people lose money then they sell because of the exact point to your last slide and they wait and they hate the market and things are terrible then we start buying the market starts going up and then the FOMO happens again people put the money and then the market goes down again so majority of average do-it-yourself investors we call it the brother-in-law syndrome right it's the brother-in-law who tells you how he's doing very well in the market but never talks about how poorly he has done over 10 years in the market. It's only the, win the, the winning companies that everyone discussed. And um, it, it truly is, Warren Buffett said it, be greedy when others are fearful, fearful when others are greedy, right? And, and the time in the market is much more important than trying to time the market. And I'll bring one last um, example. I was with, um, um, uh, pros with a prospect yesterday who signed uh, documents and became our client, right? So that's kind of so that um, for our listeners, they can follow along. And the gentleman asked me, he said, well, should we wait for when there is a pullback? And I said, well, first of all, you just signed the documents, right? So it will take us a few days to open the account, get the check into the account, deposit it. And I said, perhaps from a weekly standpoint yes you could look there is a down day maybe that's a better opportunity to invest but in the scheme of 10 15 20 years it wouldn't matter what happened today and if you got in because the market was down a point right and um once you bring the perspective that there is a bigger picture and that's what we are here for as your professionals we're no different than doctors you come in with a headache they do blood work on you and they tell you what's going on with you, but they look at the whole physiology. They don't just look, they have a headache, here's the head, will go away. So this is, but again, this is where our partners such as Tom and Doug, um, the team at Voya and our teams at BlackRock and Thurnberg and MFS funds, Voya, uh, um, Voya, I already said Voya, and Vanguards and TIA, they become important to us. And then we discuss, we, we are in these type of webinars with them as all of you are in this webinar with us. I hope I'm explaining myself clear enough. Absolutely, Vlad, you're doing a great job. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Tom, yeah. Um, let's see, um, any, any questions? Well, then why don't I kick it off? So the question that I have is, what is the consensus in terms of this is an election year, right? Election years usually are pretty, pretty volatile as is. And what is your take on what might the second half of this year look like? From a economic standpoint, stock market standpoint? Uh, yes, let's talk about the stock market. Um, what the second half would look like, uh, considering also the fact that we are, you know, we're about to go into the election. Do you sure. think people will be booking gains or do you think people will continue being in the market? Great question, Vlad. So I would say this. Um, the market has been discounting what's happening recently as you've seen this market continually going up given this wave of bad economic data. And I had mentioned that it's discounting looking into the future for the next six months. When you look at what's happened in the first quarter, the GDP was down 5%. In the second quarter, it's estimated to be down 25%. In fact, corporate earnings growth is expected to be down about 13% in the first quarter. But there's a consensus out there that feel that the third quarter, we may be flat. Fourth quarter, we start to tick up. And in 2021, we're going to start to expand. Now, I've also seen as well that we could be up 30% in the fourth quarter. 
I think what you're going to see really is going to depend on a few different factors, Brian. Primarily what you're seeing right now. If you look at the Dow being down almost 1,400 to 1,500 points, it's the transportation stocks that are getting hammered right now. Retailers are getting hammered. You know who's going up? Netflix and Amazon, those stay-at-home stocks, as we saw, they were soaring during the last three months. Um, if this second wave really picks up steam, I know that the governors out there do not really want to implement another round of social distancing, but if the cases spike too high, that may be a possibility. And if it does, it's really going to slow down this recovery. So it's really going to depend on how quickly we open up, how we get back to full capacity, if there's going to be a second wave that's starting right now, how bad it's going to be, and does that lead into a third wave? So there's still a lot of unknown factors out there. Um, again, I would say we're most likely going to see a W-shaped recovery within the market, which may be the start today. We, we, we may start to go back down, testing those before we go right back up. Um, in the economy, we may be plateauing right now. We still are seeing, we still feel U-shaped, but if you think of the letter U, we're right at that bottom right now, and I think we're going to be plateaued there for a little while before we start to go back up. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. We did have a question that came through. Um, what do you think about Fed policy and the outlook for bonds? Another great question. So the Fed has pumped in a ton of money to the point where it made the financial crisis just look like a dry run. <laughs> By the time this is all said and done, you could see the Fed pump in well over $10 trillion. And they're not only buying treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, they're also buying e fixed income ETFs now. Um, high yield bonds, creation of lending facilities in order to keep the markets as liquid as possible. What is the effect going to be? Negative rates are bad. We all know it. I don't, we really don't foresee negative rates happening, but could that be a possibility? It could be. Um, that's a very vague answer. It's really about the law of unintended consequences. And there's a great blog that Doug put out that talked about triage on the battlefield. We need to fix today and we'll worry about tomorrow when it comes. Right. Very good. And, yep. and by the way, I would mention to everybody too, that the Global Perspectives website is a public site. You have access to Doug Cote's daily blogs and they do a phenomenal job in keeping you updated with what's going on in the marketplace today. Again, the news is changing by the day. You really got to be on it 24-7, and most people don't have time for that. Um, I would recommend you looking at those blogs on a daily basis, but you could also have access to his weekly commentaries as well. Excellent. And the last thing that I would like to ask is, what would be your recommendation for asset allocation views and investing principles for an average investor? Say that one more time, Vlad. You broke up on me. Oh, I apologize. sorry. Yeah, I that's think okay. I, that's okay. Yet again, I put my hand over my speaker. So, I uh, let me also rephrase my question. Um, sure. Obviously, we exist for a reason. This is, you know, we're hired by companies and families to help them navigate the ups and downs of the financial market. At the same time, what would you recommend? What would be your advice for an asset allocation and investing principles to an average invest investor? I would look at global perspectives. And the reason being is because not for what we've done recently, but what we've done over time, global perspectives was designed to manage client expectations, client emotions through a strict rules-based methodology, but also has an equal weighting methodology as well. And what that means is inside of the mutual fund or the market models, you have 10 underlying holdings at 10% a piece. So they get like 10, 10, 10 right? That's important because when you spread out evenly, meaning that you have 10% in small caps, 10% in mid caps, 10% in large caps, 10% in, in, in international, 10% in emerging markets, and then 10% in intermediate grade bonds, high yield bonds, and right down the line, what that does is eliminate over concentration risk. So one holding does not dominate the performance up or down per se of the overall portfolio. So if large caps, let's say, are selling off tremendously, yes, we have a 10% weighting, but other managers out there may be overweight large caps. They may be overweight other sectors or other asset classes out there where we are not going to be. 
We are meant to, as much as possible, mitigate the effects of a bear market. And given these unprecedented times, and even what we've seen in the last 12 years, we may have seen a bear market on average of 18 to 24 months if it wasn't for the Fed stepping in through quantitative easing, through central bank intervention. Um, and this is why you want to own global perspectives. That's how we could add value to you. We could help mitigate the effects as much as possible from a bear market. There's no such thing as a silver bullet. There's no such thing as protection out there. Um, we come close to it. So we would make a great, great compliment to any other manager that you would be looking at today. Excellent. Um, I'd like to thank Tom and uh, our partners at Voya. I'd like to thank all of you for participating and joining us in this webinar. I'd like to add one last thing that, you know, again, your time in the market is more important than timing in the market. We, we've picked up many uh, airline stocks and hospitality stocks and uh, Las Vegas and uh, restaurants at the time when people thought we were crazy. But that's when you want to buy them. You want to buy them when no one else wants to touch something. You know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that Tesla at $1,000 is valued more than every single automobile manufacturing company in the world, right? And a lot of it is just sex appeal allure um, other than common sense. Um, Apple at $350 with their evaluations. Many of you recall my analysis of uh, would you pay a dollar for a bottle of water? And most of you say yes, maybe even three or five or seven dollars for a bottle of water, depending how thirsty you are, or maybe if you're at the concert or the beach. But probably nobody's going to pay a hundred dollars for a bottle of water, right? Unless, I don't know, you're in Saqqara Desert. Well, when companies that are keep on going up in value that are already valued at 100 times their earnings, that probably is not the company you should be inv investing in. How about a company that's trading at two times what they earn, or three or four? much more reasonable than a company that's trading at 150 or 300 times. And believe me, we do see them. And uh, again, history tends to repeat itself. And all of us are educated enough to follow the steps. And again, I repeat myself, be greedy when others are fearful and be fearful when others are greedy. Thank you all and have a wonderful afternoon. Take care. Thank you, Vlad. Take care.